Okay, one, one two, two three. three. Welcome. I'm not doing that. Okay, we were supposed to have both of us say welcome <laughs> together because we were trying to change up the intros. But welcome back to another Meaningful People podcast episode. I'm Yaakov Langer. And I'm Nachi Gordon. And you're seeing us in a different... If you're, watching, us, yeah. if you're watching us, if you're, if you're listening to us, just keep driving. But if you're watching us on YouTube... You're seeing us in a different way. We're like way close to the camera. Yes. Different background. New setup. Different over here. vibe. Yeah. New setup. Very excited about it. New setup because for this specific guest, they said we want a new setup <laughs> that didn't no. happen. Not at all. So we had on a couple, a duo, which we don't typically have. We had Roy and Le- Leah Newberger. Power couple. Power couple. So incredible story about their lives. Yeah. So so I. I I'll say this straight out. This straight has been out. one of my favorite episodes. Okay. There were over 16. This is one of my favorite. It's a story of how they found Hashem, but it's also how they found Hashem together. They went through that yeah. process together. I, I want one of our, um, maybe I'll do it myself even, just make a montage of the amount of times Yaakov said, my favorite episode. What? This what is my you favorite episode. You think my I favorite say episode. that a lot? I, come on. I'm come on, little, but hold on. Let's, let's straight up. After I did tell you, I'm like, that was incredible. I know. That's so, true. I'll okay. give it to you. But yeah, guys, we're going to stop blabbering on. This is an amazing episode. Their life is something that is so inspiring. Mm-hmm. They have come such a long way from where they were, and they continue to go, and they have an amazing family. So enjoy this episode with the Newbergers. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast, the podcast where we talk to people who are meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. So we're here together with Roy S. Newberger. <laughs> I, I Googled you and didn't uh, find the S first. And Leah Newberger. Do you go by Leah? Or? Yeah. My English name is Linda. Linda, right, really, okay. Everyone calls me Leah, though. Everyone calls you Leah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're together with two of you, all the way from Eretz Yisrael. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, you're not from Eretz Yisrael. I feel like okay. all our episodes start off that way because <laughs> no one ever stays in the, put, stays in the same place. <laughs> so where are you each from? So, actually, the name of my first book, our first book, gives it away from Central Park to Sinai, How I Found My Jewish Soul. I g- grew up in Manhattan, not the Lower East Side, the Upper East Side of Manhattan. We were always right near Central Park, and we grew up in this very affluent world a world which uh, as i say in the book i mean we had everything and we had nothing and uh, two remarkable amazing parents um everybody's jewish but you know the old american story but we were so assimilated there was by that time there was zero Jewish content in our life. I mean, the biggest day of the year for me when I was a kid was December 25th, <laughs> and we had nothing. We had no Rosh Hashanah, no Yom Kippur, no Pesach, nothing. And um, and it's it, you know it should be the American dream, but for me. My, I just, I, I don't know. I guess I have a very strong something in there, pintalayid, I guess, and it was, it, it, it couldn't take it. It could not, na- could not take that world. I couldn't breathe. I could not breathe. You are and always <clears throat> unable to breathe, or like a hit a point where you're like, this life. I was isn't. always unable to breathe from when I was a little. My earliest. Memories, I'm talking five, six, seven years old. Something was wrong. Something was missing. And actually, the breathing metaphor is not, I mean, it's not such an exaggeration. I mean, I had, I had like physical, you know, my stomach hurt. And, 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 and I, I had, it was like a physical, I felt like a slave. I always say this is an amazing thing, you know. There's something called the Yetzirah. I mean, everybody knows what the Yetzirah is. So I didn't know what the Yetzirah was when I was a little kid. I never heard the word Torah in my life. I never heard the word, certainly, Yetzirah. I mean, I, but as a little kid 
who never heard this word, I saw the Yetzirah in front of me. I felt like there's some force that's more powerful than I am, and it's controlling me. And I can't do what I want to do. And, and at the same, the same, by the same you know, token, it, I, what I didn't want to do, it could make me do. I felt like I was a slave. And literally, I spent the first 30 years of my life, and then when my wife and I met in high school at the age of 16 and 15, I mean, everything's an amazing story. Everything is like three hours, so I'm glad we're speaking here for you know, like three, <laughs> three days straight marathon because that's how much time we need. But anyway, I, 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 so until we found... Until we, until I eliminated every other thing, because you know, like Torah is the last thing. That's a that's a story in itself, but that was you know the last thing. Until everything else was eliminated, finally there was nothing left but Torah at the end. Then that's when we, we, I want to. I'm interrupting. I want to get to that, but I want to ask your what like. Leah, was that your experience? Can I call you Leah? I don't know what it's I fine. Rebbitson? I don't know what to call ah, If her husband was a re- was a rabbi, <laughs> she'd be a Rebbitson, but you know. Mrs. Neuberger. Uh, Mrs. Uh, so Neuberger, maybe. W- what was your experience like? You Did you so, grow up So religious? I grew up uh, assimilated, but not as much as, as uh, my husband. He, my wife is his normal, family, and I'm crazy. You know, the German, <laughs> the German Jews uh, so often, I mean, so many of them, uh, it assimilated so much that they became Christians, or they came almost Christians, and and uh, so uh, my husband's family was involved with ethical culture, which had been founded by a German Jew <coughs> named Felix Adler in 1875, and he took ethical teachings from the Torah. He subtracted God. He subtracted mitzvahs. His father was a Reform rabbi, but that was too far to the right for him. So he subtracted all that and made ethics a religion. So that's what they were into. My family. <coughs> On, on my mother's side, just if, you know, her parents had been had been observant to a great extent. They came from Poland, but in America, they, you know, they couldn't get work and so on, and and, and this kind of it disappeared uh, in the next generation. So I had some some connection. My grandfather made a seder, and I had to stay home from school. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, out of respect, but I didn't. We didn't observe anything. Mm-hmm. By then, it was gone. It just disappears so fast. On my father's side, there were all rabbis in Vilna named Rabinowitz. So my father's father was an orphan at a young age. He became an atheist, and it was cut. So anyway, I, I did grow up feeling something was missing, just like my husband did. I didn't feel it so intensely. I wasn't so miserable with it, but I felt like there must be more to life than just living you grew one up in day New York to the next. Also? So I, I lived in East Rockaway, which is not far from <laughs> here. Really? I lived in Strakway till I was I, 14. When Yako's I, been trying to have a, Jew, a Jewish community, you know, started in, Jewish, in East Rockway. Again. Uh, really? Yeah, it's so funny you say East there's Rockway. A conserv- there was a conservative synagogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't still, really work for us? <laughs> it's still there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, East Rockway Jewish Center? Yeah. I, I went to Friends Bar Mitzvahs, and I, um, we, we didn't observe anything, but when I heard everyone saying Shema Yisrael at the Bar Mitzvah, I, I felt something. Hmm. I definitely felt something, but I didn't. I really didn't know anything, and but, but both of you knew that you were Jewish. Yeah, but his, all our parents Jewish, so very assimilated. And then I, I felt there has to be a higher meaning and purpose in life, and there's got to be more to live for, and there's got to be truth, and it's got to be right and wrong. The way we were raised, if if I thought something's right, you thought it was wrong. It was wrong for you. It was right for me. So th- I, it didn't make sense to me. I said there has to be right and wrong. So then when we met, I was in ninth grade. He was in tenth grade. 15 and 16 years old he made me more intensely aware of it and together we searched all the years for the real thing okay so tell us i guess tell us a little bit about that (laughs) about that search i mean ninth and tenth grade and you start planning we need to find we need to find religion i I, I, I want to start no it wasn't religion at that point i want to go back to seven i want to go back to seven years old i I just want to add something also about my parents it's amazing you know i think one reason that I was so intensely, emotionally starving, starving, it's not an exaggeration, for Hashem, was my, my parents, it, it, it's amazing what their, their 
background tells you about them. My middle name, Roy S. Newberger, S. is Salant. My mother's maiden name was Salant. And my grandfather told me, my mother's father, when I was a little kid, we come from a famous rabbi, Israel Salanter. Mm. So what did I know? What did I care? I didn't care. You know, I mean, rabbi, I don't even know what a rabbi is. But, but, but my mother, without having any idea what it meant, was a real Salanter. She had a neshama that was so sensitive, so starched. She was always working on herself. She was never good enough. She would tear her own, you know, actions apart. And, 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 and she, I mean, despite growing up in this affluent world, I don't think she had any real simcha in her life until be, we became observant. And then it's unbelievable. I mean, at the end of her life, Everything changed. She saw, she saw, she saw, you know, Jewish grandchildren, and 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 um, and she came to Yerushalayim with us for Pesach, the first Pesach of her life. She was seventy something years old. She came there as a soul with us, and and it was unbelievable. So that was my mother. My father, who was, and this is not an exaggeration, a genius in business. It was amazing. He founded a f very famous Wall Street firm. His mother's name was Rothschild, and he was a Rothschild. So these two, I these two influences, really, you know, um, I'm, I, I see how they both played out in my life. So I started looking for something, you know, and certainly wasn't Torah. I mean, Inside, you know, every 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 yid, everybody knows everybody. The malach taught everybody in the womb, so you know you know what the truth is somewhere. It, it's interesting because you you briefly mentioned your father was you know very smart and very successful, but according to the internet, <laughs> he was extremely successful. I, I like up there in. In terms he, of finance, he was a legend in Wall Street. Yeah, and and he still is. So it's interesting because I would imagine that you and 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 Mrs. I, I don't know what your upbringing was like, but I would imagine that you you would technically have everything that you would ever want. That's right. That's right. That's the speaking, amazing we thing. Did. You but, both but, did. But you. Well, I wasn't as you know as, as as we weren't as as wealthy as my husband's family, but we were very comfortable. My husband, uh, my father. I'm sorry. Um, was a, a successful businessman. He was also an artist. Maurice Valenci, his name was he. Mm. He uh, designed and he made furniture, and then he, he was very well known for quality and for good design and so on. Anyway, um, so we we had everything we needed, materially speaking. And that wasn't and enough. That, but that you know, you, you you want if if you're just living for know. material things, you want the next thing, and then you get that, you want the next thing, and then the next thing, and you're never satisfied. So we uh. both felt that way, and that's why. What we did it when we were in high school, t we wanted to make the world better, have more meaning in life. We got inv active in all kinds of causes like civil rights movement and conservation mm -hmm. and, um, you know, trying to make s have fun some kind of beauty and purity in the world. And, uh, and then in college, we went to University of Michigan. and Together. We, w <laughs> we did everything together. <laughs> so we... we uh, he was a year ahead of me in school, and then after my freshman and his sophomore year at University of Michigan, we got married. And Michigan was a big thing for the peace movement, you know, during the Vietnam War, and we got, we were trying to make peace in the world, and we were working and working. But it didn't fill that emptiness inside, that feeling something's missing, something's wrong, something so, so empty, like, there has to be more, there has to be more. And then uh, the amazing thing happened in, when we were in college. I think you should tell about it when you woke up in the middle of the night. What happened? You should know. I should tell? Okay. Yeah, th this is amazing considering our upbringing and our circles that, so, uh, that we were in secular I mean, as could be. If years and years of searching. I mean, I looked everywhere. I mean, I, 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 the, it, 
It's all in the first book, Central Park to Sinai. Can and, you give us a taste of, of the a places? Taste? Yeah, I yeah, saw mine. Sure, definitely. First of all, when I was a little kid, I heard there's something. I'm talking, again, little means six, seven, eight, nine years old already. I heard there's something called religion. I mean, see, my wife ha has a more intellectual view of finding what we're looking for. My, I, I, this was visceral. This was emotional. And I, I was starving. I, I, had to, I, I couldn't breathe. So I heard there's something called religion. So, okay, you know, like maybe this has to do with stuff like this. So my mother sent me to Sunday school, very liberal Sunday school. And at the Sunday school, we learned about all different religions, you know, Catholicism, Protestantism, Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, you name it, everything, even a little... Judaism, whatever that is, and one and, hour and and and, and, <laughs> and Sunday and, school, and, <laughs> and 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 but it's nothing. It's just a theory. When you you know, it's like comparative religion. Nothing. So what else? Nature, like the world is so so phony. It's so corrupt. So you go out uh, uh, a a mountain, a tree. Ah, uh, it's beautiful. It's real. It's not you we know. It's not phony. It's not fun. So I got into hiking, and 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 I did a lot of hiking. And together we we did we we worked for the National Park Service. We were fire lookouts. <laughs> we lived on a mountaintop <laughs> in Oregon. Oregon. Yeah, I know, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then and what else? Then great authors. I mean, they had the answer: Shakespeare, Chaucer, Milton. So I got uh, so I got into English literature. We both majored in and, English language and, and literature. And that's hmm. what, what I majored in. And that, by the way, is really how I started writing also be the two were intertwined so and then and then the 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 you know the Jewish uh, causes like what my wife mentioned the P, you know uh, Dr. Martin Luther King that whole era with the beginning of the civil rights movement the we pick it secular Jewish we, causes we, 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 <laughs> <laughs> right right thank you correction and, and we picketed we, we used to demonstrate outside Woolworths in, in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 60s, the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. Then during the Vietnam War, the, the, the war anti-war movement. And then, and, and, and all these, every ism, every, every, every possibility of something that was real to live for, live by the, you know, made life real, I, I, I tried. And nothing worked, nothing worked. Because inside, my, my just, my neshama was just churning, churning up. And I, I still couldn't breathe. And I still had no menucha at all. So, you didn't know that. So, so I didn't know that. <laughs> so, so we, so, and then the miracle happened. And, you know, I mean, you should know, I talked about it in the book. Uh, but, I mean, what can I say? I mean, I'm this, because I had all these crazy thoughts in my head. I'm this Nebuch in high school. And then, you, don't you know, have to my, go into and, that. And, and, and my <laughs> wife came, Linda Valencia came to the Fieldston School, this very ritzy, progressive school. Of course, 98% Jewish, just like us, Jew, Jewish. So into this, uh, like, ritzy, um, um, uh, sophisticated, private school in in the upper reaches of um, New York City in, in Riverdale, this almost, not almost, very suburban, ritzy community came Linda Valenci. Um, um, and, and, okay, so I'm going to get um, um, I'm, I'm going to get you know bashed for this when I leave here. No, my right. wife, Don't my wife, well, <laughs> my wife can't stand <laughs> when I say this. But this happens to be total MS. It's true. I mean Miss Universe. I mean she. Mm -hmm. so everything Please. stopped. It's not a joke. Everything stopped in the school <laughs> when she came. And like I'm never going to speak to this. I, I talk about. I, it's such a nace that I ever had the guts to open my mouth and say one word to Linda Valencia. It's a miracle. Years I compare ago. it. Wow. It's actually. <laughs> It's actually last week's Parsha. I compare it to, 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 to Billum's mule opening its mouth and words coming out. I mean, I was the mule, and the words came out, and I started talking to Linda Valencia. Wow. And for some crazy reason, reason she talked back. She, we had a conversation, and we started going out. And like you should know, it's like many decades later, and they still can't believe it at the Fieldston School. Anyway, we, got, we started going out. and then Excuse me. We, you know, you had an image of yourself that you know you were really she doesn't understand whatever not so terrific she's so but normal she doesn't get it were. 
everyone else liked you. You're yeah. very funny. <laughs> yep. You're very okay. nice looking. I get You're it. <laughs> you were popular, but you didn't think of yourself as being something. My wife so is so good. normal that she doesn't <laughs> understand what crazy people are like. You guys are horrible. <laughs> when I say that, I'm I'm tearing up a little only because like I think it's very beautiful. Like what? It is beautiful. No, like really, what you have your relationship Not is a really joke. sweet, and it's. Cool Hashem, we've been married 58 years. 58 wow. years, wow. Is that insane? How old are you guys when you got married? 19 and 20. My and mother had to come to City Hall with me to get a marriage license. <laughs> it had, had to, to be 21 and I was those days, had to be really? 21, the boy. Now you'd be, like, now you'd be like seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, so I w- but, but I, I have to tell you what happened. We got married... And there's a famous, you know, there's a famous vart that... Excuse me, I just want to say something that you, that you say when we speak, I think, is very relevant here. We never even met anyone who believed in God when we were growing up. That's how si- assimilated we were. And then in college, for, him, for this to happen, you're about to tell what happened. So is is really a miracle. And wait, one more thing that I'm sorry, I was gonna, that I was going to say before, is that my husband says... We didn't believe in God, but God believed in us, and He put us together. And it's that's that's it's a huge nace. And if my husband had married a non-Jew, his parents wouldn't have cared. If I had married a non-Jew, my parents would have cared, but they wouldn't have said anything. So even just that we married each married a Jew is amazing, a miracle in itself. And then that Hashem put us together is it's just Baruch Hashem. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing. So it is amazing. Every step is amazing, and it's miracle upon miracle. So what happened in college? So what happened in college? Every person we got married. First of all, to understand and see it. I didn't want a rabbi. I mean, no way, rabbi. I mean, I I want uh, a leader of the ethical culture society. Excuse me, you're supposed to tell about waking up in the middle of the night in college. I know. Oh, (laughs) okay. I'm getting there. I'm just a little background. A little background. And, 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 yeah, so we got married. So my wife's grandfather insisted you have to have a rabbi. Okay, so we searched for the world's most reformed rabbi, and we pretty, were pretty successful. We found the, yeah, found the guy who was really more like a, you know, Catholic priest than, <laughs> than a rabbi. He was Jewish. And, and <laughs> anyway, we got married. So there's a famous vart. Ish and Isha. Ish has a Yud. Isha has a Hey. Yud and Hey together stand for what's an ideal marriage? Ish, Isha, and Hashem. In other words, marriage is not simple. I mean, it's the most complicated relationship there is. You need help to make it work. You need Hashem in your home. So the Vart goes on. You take Yud out of Ish and Hey out of Isha, and you get Ish, fire. So that is what happened to us. We experienced it. It happened to us. We got married in, after my second year and, her, and Leia's, my wife's first year at the University of Michigan. We were students and we were married a few years and there was fire. And it just, you know, like, uh, 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 so you have an argument. Everybody has an argument, you know, but, but if you have a Shem in that house, so, so you know, he, Hashem is there to pour water on the fire to help you, to help you get over it and, and move onward and build, build up. But we didn't have Hashem in our marriage. So the fire burned out of control. After two and a half years of marriage, it was like blowing up. Not like, it was blowing up. And my whole life was blowing up. I couldn't concentrate on my, I was a graduate student then at the University of Michigan. I couldn't concentrate on my work. I couldn't, it was just, it was like everything was falling apart. And it came to a climax on, I remember, to the 2nd, January 10th, 1966. You can go, if you're ever in Ann Arbor, Michigan, you can go to 606 East Ann Street, <laughs> Ann Arbor, Michigan, 48108. There should be one of those historical signs in front of the house. <laughs> so at 2 in the morning, I woke up, and I'm crying, and it's all over. It's all over. I tried everything. I had this like a metaphor in my head, a scene in my head, like my life is this long corridor. There are hundreds of doors off the corridor. I opened every door, every derech, everything I could possibly think of, like this will save me, this will save me, and nothing worked. Every door led nowhere, and I was finished, and there was nothing left, and the world was blowing up, and I literally feel that either it was like 
Mem Tes Shari Tuma in Mitzrayim, either you go over the edge and you go to Gehenna, and it's not a joke. I mean, I literally think <clears throat> if something miraculous didn't happen, and it did, that I literally might have spent the rest of my life in a mental institution. I'm not joking. But all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I had this crazy thought. I mean, people do want to live. People want to live. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to go over the edge. And... I had this crazy thought, maybe could there be a God? Like, whoa, no, no way, God. I mean, are you crazy? Like, okay, if you were a monk, you know, living in the Middle Ages, okay, so you believe in God. But I mean, like, I'm this sophisticated, you know, brilliant student in this very great university, blah, 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 blah. You know, God, I mean, where's God? That's ridiculous. And then I realized... If your life is falling apart, you need God, God, if you're there, help me, save me, get me out of this. And all of a sudden, I thought, wow, maybe God is real. And at that moment, this was the, like, total, like, I, I, I'm see, I don't, I don't want to sound nuts. <laughs> I, am, I am nuts, but I don't want to sound. You're it. not nuts. Okay, I know I'm not nuts. Okay, my you're wife. Just my, it, you're that, just intense. Isn't that you're not <laughs> nuts. My wife keeps telling me I'm not nuts. I love it. I mean, what do you do with I, what I, without this? I, I I don't know where I'd be. I'm not joking. Anyway, uh, so so so, but um, I lost my train of thought. But but but, so yeah. So you're, like, you're screaming to God. Where's yeah. God? And, and 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 everything turned around. All of a sudden, I could breathe. For the first time in my life, I had hope. Well, what did he do? I mean, what had just happen? the thought that there is some being that is totally powerful, who is benevolent and is more powerful than me, and can get me out of this. And, and and like, you know, Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim is mentioned every day, a zillion times a day. Why? Because it's every, everybody is goes through it all the time. That was my Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim. Hashem took me out of a situation where I was really a slave. I had no control over my whole emotional, mental state, even, you know, what, what I did in mm. life. And all of a sudden, you know, you admit into your brain the possibility that there is some being who is totally powerful and who wants to help you and can help you and he and he will help you and he is helping you and the very fact that you had that thought is indication that you know he exists and and i had hope for the first time in my life i was 23 years old i never had hope before but it's interesting, you know, Jews are akshonim. I mean, I'm not accusing anyone else, but I am certainly an auction. <laughs> and, 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 and so from then on, it's still, I still didn't want to be Jewish. Um, and, and, and it took me eight years until I, w- then I, but I started believing in quote unquote religion then. Mm. That's, when, that's when I, we, because we did everything together, got into Hinduism, Buddhism, and then finally Christianity. I wrote a book at the end of this, by the end of this period we were, we were living in England. <coughs> I was at Oxford University. We're both at Oxford University. Oh, and for Christianity? Yeah. Okay. No, we were I Ox- wrote a book. You could see no, no, a we were copy Oxford of the studying, manuscript. Excuse me. We were stu- he was studying English language and literature <coughs> and I was in art school there painting and drawing. At Oxford University, after he got his master's, I got my bachelor's in Michigan. We went to Oxford. The, wow. the, the name of the book. I assume Art School didn't publish that one. Right, <laughs> Art School did not publish one of my <laughs> books. Or or That's or another whole story. Or mosaic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Art School did not exactly publish this book. The book was called "Why the Jews Are Wrong and the Christians Are Right." Really? That's what it's called. Wow. Rebbets and Young Rice. That, didn't, a- that didn't age well, did it? <laughs> if you read it, you'll understand why it was never published. It is such. Gold garbage <laughs> but i thought it was the greatest book in the world rebbitson esther young rice told us told me yisrael when i finally got a jewish name yisrael 
keep one copy of this book because someday you're going to say, you know, I'm a big tzaddik and I, w- I would never have written a book like that. <laughs> you have to remember, it's like Yosef looking into the bore, looking into the pit where his brothers threw him. He, you have to remember where you were <laughs> that, and you one day, you have, to, you have to look back and remember. Listen, I w- they always I say, that. don't put things in writing and you sure uh, did. <laughs> but, but you should but understand that he was so upset because no one wanted to publish it. <laughs> and it was never published. He just has the manuscript. And at the time, he said, oh, God, what are you doing to me? I wrote this great book, and you're not published. You know, I can't get it published. And now he says, Baruch Hashem, it was yeah. never, never published. published. <laughs> we'll be right back to that episode of the Meaningful People podcast, and we're joined by Ali, the AMR mascot. The, well, hold on. Who named, who by this beer is Brismila named Ali? Well, who, said it, who said it's a boy? Oh, just assuming the wow, gender, that's, which is not. That's, that's not. That's 2021 not. Twenty twenty-one-ish. Cancel Yaakov Linger, everybody. I apologize for that. Um, but like, I don't even know if we have to say anything on AMR, other than we're joined by a bear ma- mascot for AMR. What other pharmacy has a bear mascot? I first of all, I don't even know if this is their real mascot. I don't even know if it's a bear. If it's not, we we're petitioning for those listening. We have a giant, light, uh, almost it definitely childlike uh, sized bear. You said life size. Yeah, well, it's baby life sized beer know. with AMR merch on it. And I don't even know if a- I mean Amar gave us some sweatshirts, clocks, beers, a lot of fun stuff. But that's not even why you should be using Amar. You should be using Amar if you're living in New York, New Jersey, because you want a reliable pharmacy. The They're- best pharmacy in the world, mm-hmm. in fact. So go ahead, give them a call at 848-222-1110. It's you know what that means. It's getting cold outside. It's bear season where they Ooh. go into hibernate. Yeah. Right. So it's all Allie. those. Allie's unse- going all- to yeah, Ali's going to hi- hibernate. Which, by the way, if if you've been watching, you could kind of look and. We're much I'm moving forward. We're going to try to have a neater space. But uh, every here and there, you saw Allie, the yeah. beer in the background of like you know Ben Rothman. Because, because like hibernation that. time, you're not going to see Allie for a little while. Um, but you will have the best pharmacy in the mm, world if you uh, go ahead and give them a call at 848-222-1110 or visit amrfarmrx.com. If you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for Allie. Now back to the episode. So I, I'm a little curious. <laughs> like you, you dabbled in like... <clears throat> We always hear stories about Balchuvas trying out different religions. Nothing we didn't try. I didn't try especially. Really? Yeah. The only thing is, Baruch Hashem, drugs. I just was well, afraid of drugs. Well, we good things, things that are I, potentially I, good well, anyway. Come on, Avodah Zara. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean. I mean, but it was, I mean you didn't like Avodah Zara. Dr- we, drugs we, we, drugs we, I never got It was a part of a spiritual That search. was just too, like. What did, you, what did you find on your search for religion? You know, what, was the, what were the pit oh, stops like? So, so it's very interesting. My wife always likes me to tell the story, but <clears throat> the reason when in in in, 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 in on January tenth, nineteen sixty six, my birthday is January eleventh. So oh, so right close. There's a whole story. But I wasn't I born in sixty six. I was born thirty one years whole, later. <laughs> that whole week, oh, okay, miracles that happened to us in all the years since then. During this week, I feel like a malach came and and visited us in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and came comes back every year at that time. It, it's not a joke. Anyway, so but 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 I, I thought to myself then, like I went to this bar mitzvah, I went to my friend's bar mitzvah, and this guy got up with some I guess like super reformed bar mitzvah and he got some blah blah blah. He said something or other. He had no clue what he's saying. Nobody in the room had a clue what he's saying. Then we had this amazing, you know, roast beef and then we gave him like amazing checks and the guy had an amazing bank account so like jews are into roast beef and jews are into bank accounts and like where's god so yeah. that's when i started getting into hinduism we had a professor from india we studied with and then i got into buddhism and then i got into christianity and, and both of you did this you yeah, both went may on? i just say here sure. that uh we were major students and we studied and studied and studied we never went to services or anything like that don't say never mm-hmm. What we didn't go, we didn't go to a Buddhist temple well, or I a was Hindu. Inside some places, what do you mean? Whatever. <laughs> you never we used went to, to sing ser- carols or whatever. Well, right? that in high school, that yeah, was the thing. All the Jews went around sing, singing Xmas carols. But <laughs> that's uh, that's something that's else. Interesting. No, but no, but the point is that that we were searching for something real and and truth, and and we wanted to be normal people, and we wanted to to raise a family and be part of a community and have a meaningful spiritual life and all these we were looking for the highest the real the real thing the truth and in these other ways t- uh, to find if you into the highest you have to sit on a mountain and contemplate or you have you know be an ascetic or, or remove yourself from society be a monk or a nun or, or or 
all these things that were just so extreme, and we, we wanted to be normal people at the same time, and we never found that, and it was really our, our Jewish souls, or the Pintalini was telling us, no, that's not it, that's not it. But we really studied and studied and studied to find the right, the, the real thing. And how did you find it? So I should really tell about Walter Grenfell and everything, right? <coughs> okay, and then let me tell the story, because otherwise it's going to take three hours, because <laughs> I can tell faster than you. What? <laughs> Because <laughs> we have to get to a Wait, but I, I, I want to tell what happened with Walter. Oh, Grenfell. yeah. That's, you that's, can both do it. You're yeah. on. You do it. Go ahead. Well, after <laughs> England and after my book didn't get published, the one, you know, why the Jews are wrong and the Christians are right. So, so we moved back to America and we moved to the, uh, up the Hudson Valley near um, uh, Newburgh, New York. Uh, nothing to do with our name, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> but there's a community there called Cornwall on Hudson. And we settled there. And, 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 and it happened, we had some family friends there. It's a beautiful community, Storm King Mountain, near, near West Point. And um, it happened that the local weekly newspaper was for sale in this town. Now, this was a newspaper dating from 1885. And, and it intrigued me because I, I'm a, you know, I'm a, the thing I do most naturally is write. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just... At our school, we were we were really well trained in English. In high school, it was in, in, in many ways it was a great school for secular stuff, and and of course, of course a lot of our brilliant Jewish teachers. Anyway, we took over the newspaper. I became the publisher, and there is an organization in the United States called the National Newspaper Association. The association of weekly newspapers in the US. I'm sure it was a lot bigger then, we're talking like 1970s, <clears throat> because all these, you know, a lot of newspapers have gone out of business since then. But the head of the organization at that time was a brilliant Jewish guy named Walter Grunfeld. Mm -hmm. he, was the, he was the nephew of Diane Grunfeld, who was a very famous person. He was uh, based in, in London. And the, the two brothers came from Germany. Diane Grunfeld came to England, and his brother came to the States. Walter Grunfeld was his brother's son. Walter Grunfeld was the head of the National Newspaper Association. So he was, he, he was I, I became his friend, and he was a great speaker. And I, so I called him up one day, Walter, you know, we want to spend the day with you. We want to learn how to make a great newspaper. So he had three newspapers in Binghamton, New York. So we traveled up to Binghamton one day, and we spent the day with him. At the end of the day, we were going to drive back to our house in Cornwall, and we stopped at his house before we left for coffee, and he wanted to watch the news. It was 6.30 at night. He turned on the TV, and he's watching the news. And Walter Grunfeld, it's one of those unforgettable scenes you'll see why in a minute that you know you can, you'll never you never forget your entire life he's standing in front of the tv watching the news and he's crying he's crying what's going on it was october 1973 yom kippur war and walter grunfeld was saying like i can't believe it a week ago israel was finished it was all over now look at this general sharon just crossed the suez canal he's got the egyptians surrounded they're marching on damascus israel saved israel saved and he's crying and i'm like oh oh yeah right i i saw they had an article in the newspaper there was a war in the middle east somewhere right yeah i know about that and walter grunfeld looks at me I'm sitting in his house. He looks at me and he says, starts screaming, what kind of a Jew are you? What are you made out of stone? Mm. Though you have a heart, what kind of a Jew are you? Like, what? What, what kind of a Jew are you? Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody ever asked me that before. What kind of a Jew are you? And that started going through my head those words what kind of a jew are you this is october 1973 <clears throat> six months later the kids are make it very quick but i was speaking with a, one of my very dear friends who was an advertiser on our paper a jewish guy bob ushman who owned the hardware store in cornwall <coughs> i told him you know bob I, i'm 31 years old i was never in a synagogue in my life 
Like, what do they do there? So he was a little from Bob Hushman. So he said, oh, he called me up that night. <coughs> we have this speaker coming to our, our shul this uh, Thursday night. You want to come? It's this woman evangelist. Her, her name is Esther Young Rice. Hmm. You want to you you come? Okay, yeah. Well. And that was it. That was the switch. Met that was man. the moment. We met Rebbets and Young Rice. The whole world exploded, and <laughs> everything changed. May I just tell a little about that? Sure. <laughs> you know the story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so of course, Rebetz and Agres was not an evangelist. She wasn't trying to convert anybody, <coughs> just to bring the Jews back. So, we we uh, walked into the synagogue. My husband put on a yarmulke, you know, for the first time, against uh, my wishes. <laughs> and she told us things we'd never heard before. She told us all our souls were at Mount Sinai. When God gave us the Torah, she told us that we're descended from kings, prophets, matriarchs, patriarchs. We taught the world is a God. We gave morality to the world. We have our Torah to study and live by day and night. We'd never heard this before. We were honored students in the finest universities, and we heard brilliant people speak. And we weren't even in nursery school as far as our Judaism. We didn't know anything. And we wrote her a letter. What she would do now? We were both so moved that night that we were crying, and this, you know, we have to, we have to do more. So, what's next? She said we should come to her Torah portion of the week classes in Brooklyn on Ocean Parkway. She taught. Uh, she was in the uh, Sfardi's uh, shul in, on Ocean Parkway. It was a two-hour drive each way. It was during the energy crisis after the Yom Kippur War. It was very hard to get gas. And it was the worst night of the week. My husband had to get the newspaper put together to get to the printer. And it was uh, hours and hours and hours and hours of work. But we just looked at each other and we said, you know, we have to go. We have to find out who we are and how we should live. We're going. So we got up at 2 in the morning to get the newspaper done. We waited online to get our ration of gas. We drove the two hours each way. And finally in the classes we were finding out how to have a good marriage. Mm. how to understand what's going on in the world, how to raise our children. And we went every week to the classes for months, and then Rabbi Sinyan Grace announced a trip to Israel. And we went with her in uh, June 1974. And we got on the flight. It was an LL flight. Midnight flight, fell asleep. All of a sudden we hear noises in the middle of the night. What's going on? The men are getting up. They're putting boxes on their heads. <laughs> we had never seen or heard of Talas and Tefillin to let Ella really? flight to Israel. <laughs> Here we were, 30 and 31, married yeah. 11 years with two children, and oh, we didn't know anything. So we got to Israel, and mm. we had the first Shabbos of our lives at Kibbutz Lavi. And all those years we worked in the peace movement. <laughs> we never had a moment's peace till we had Shabbos. <laughs> So we had uh, two weeks of a Jewish life, and we had a Shabbos in Yushalayim. We get back to Cornwall on the Hudson, New York, and we looked at each other. We're out of here. We have to move to Rebbe's and Young Rice's community so we can learn and our children can learn how to live a Jewish life. That was North Woodmere. Wow. That was in 1974. Everything fell into place. My husband got a job at the Long Island Press as an editor. We found a, a house a block from Rabbi Young Rice's shul and two blocks from Rabbi and Rebbitson's house. And in September 1974, two weeks before Rosh Hashanah, we moved in. And it was a real new year for us. I'm guessing there wasn't four or five shuls like there is now in North Woodbury. Oh, my gosh. No, that was it. That was really it. And the Young Rice's were amazing how they, they kashered over 100 homes in the community they had, you know, since they'd been there, and they, and they brought people in, and then, and then, as we uh, we settled in, and then eventually, my husband became for twelve years president of the shul. I was twelve years president of the sisterhood, and we increased in membership tremendously in the shul, and it was really very, very special. Everyone felt very; it was a very warm atmosphere, and we had a kiddish, and everyone stayed, and and it was, Ms. and we would have people over for Shabbos meals all the time. And we lived a block from the shul. We were right there. 
So you should tell about all our Shabbos. Here. So I know. So so okay. So we move into we move Rosh Hashanah and and we sit, we're unpacking boxes all around us and the phone rings. Rebbe's and Young Rice, you're sending us three guests for Shabbos, but. We don't know Olive Face. We don't know. We literally didn't know Olive Face. We, we don't know Shabbos anything. We had two Shabbos so far. <laughs> and she said, it's okay. You know very little, but these people know even less than you. <laughs> and they're going to feel so comfortable with you. If you have any questions, come on down the street, ask the rabbi what to do. So we, uh, that's what we did. And that's a whole story in itself. <laughs> There's so many stories in from Central Park to Sunday about people who came for Shabbos. She's told us, Someone reached out to us, and now we reach out to others. And, and she said, Torah is like the most delicious steak dinner. You sit down by yourself to have it. It tastes good. But if you share it with someone else, it's so much more delicious. So we, ever since then, for over 40 years, we had guests every Shabbos. And not only that, I would like, we had people like sleep over in our home, three, four, five, six people sleep over. We had uh, people just for the meals. We... we took in people to live with us also because she asked us to have people who, whose home life was very hostile to Torah and have us ta- um, take, you know, take them in. So it's, it's a whole, it's, it's a whole uh, amazing story. And our children were very excited who's coming for Shabbos and they would help teach everybody, you know, everything. And all of them, you know, we had actually two daughters at that point. Then we had another daughter and another, another uh, a boy and then a girl. So they all went to yeshiva and Beis Yad. You know, instead of, uh, instead of our oldest daughter, we didn't even have Hebrew names. And um, Susan, who became Sarah, when we used to live, we had, we had uh, probably, we had considered strongly sending her to the best school in the area where all the Jews go, the Bishop Dunn Catholic School. <laughs> they but have great Christmas carols there. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, Baruch Hashem, she went to Torah Academy for Girls in Far Rockaway. Oh, wow. And <laughs> they, also, they also have great Christmas <laughs> And she, and she oh, went awesome. into first grade. And of course, My kids the, girls knows, the girls know so much by first grade. And we couldn't help her with her homework. We didn't know anything. So she had a hard first year, but then she, she rose to the top of her class and did really well. And that's where all our girls went. Today so, she's a rabbit son living in Harris's uh, uh, That's mm. right. So, yeah, it's, it's just, it was just in time we, we changed our lives. It's really never too late for anyone to make an important change in life. We were 30 and 31 already with children, and we, we totally changed our lives. And it's never, people should never feel it's too late. Did you I, find it to be difficult to raise your children mm-hmm. from, from birth when you had such a different experience? So we were so into it. it was felt, we felt like before we're dead and now we're alive. Mm. This is the real thing. This is life. This is the, this is <clears throat> such a beautiful life, and we're so excited about it. And we. What would you say you know, to? What would you say to people who, maybe, are from from birth and they're struggling with their Yiddish guide and they're on the verge of throwing it away? I mean, you're, you're what you're ta- the way you're talking. It's like you found life and you found gold. Joke. And there are people who you know yeah. every day, unfortunately, are leaving the path. I think. I think that. Uh, very often people do take it for granted and don't understand the the greatness of it. And I think that's why we, we speak in, in yeshivas and seminaries and and Beis Yaakov's and all kinds of you know places like that in addition to doing Kirov. And I, I think that a key is that s- sometimes people are so anxious to have their kids, you know, do everything that they, there's pressure, and I think the most important thing is the love and the warmth in the home, and that, and the the the, the joy should spill over, and and it should always be a very happy, happy thing. And I think sometimes people are, you know, like get uptight and, and tense about having their kids, you know, the, they're not doing the right thing or something. That, that instead of, you know, just giving them the love and the warmth, they, there's some mistakes mistakes made. I just want to make a point that our children heard our story every Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing was held. If you read that book, the first book, all of my books, <clears throat> everything is there. We have no secrets. We have, n- you know, not playing games. No, no, you know, nothing hidden. And 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 
So it's interesting because actually right now <clears throat> a, a, a book is being written about us and 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 we, as in, in the course of you know getting in, doing the preparation for this book we got a whole bunch of statements <coughs> from people who were involved with our lives 20 30 40 years ago <coughs> and and a, a lot of these people who have had incredible changes in their life i mean people who were in in cults and and, and were now you know they're 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 they live amazingly religious life, but they don't want to talk about their past. And we found... They don't want their children to know about it. We right? found that is the best thing. What, what, what is it, a secret? It's a secret where we came from? So our children were involved with the whole thing. They heard the story a thousand times. And when people would come for, for Shabbos, who never you know, had a Shabbos before, who had no clue what a sitter is, who had no clue the tilas, yadayim, hamotzi, anything, whatever, so they would sit. And it, it's, it's much better when a kid does this or teaches someone how to do the tilas, yadayim, you know? Hmm. And instead of an adult, you know, a little Someone wrote that about that. That was so so charmed by this, the six-year-old boy teaching him how to do it. And mm. everything. It's, it's, We're sitting it's sweet. in shul, right. and he said, you know, how to say Shema, <coughs> Shema Yisrael. And, 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 and the kids, our children, became part of the whole Kirov process and, 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 and lived our whole life with us. And they know everything that happened to us and we never held that we're never embarrassed by where we were and, and what uh, every step of the way and as a result they themselves you know became very you know wonderful at Kirov it became very natural for them they have and, their own Shabbos and, guests and, 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 uh, <laughs> listen you know sure. I mean we all need to do tour every day I just want to say that, sorry no, no, no. that that uh, Rebbe Tzinyang Rice told us right away we should declare the miracles and that it's a mitzvah to do that. And, and uh, we wrote our story, my husband wrote our story actually un under her column and ran for six weeks in the Jewish press under her column. And, and, uh, and people appreciate that we, we talk about the struggles we went through, we talk about the difficulties, and because people get hope from that, you know? That, that it's never too late to change and that and that there are, we always we all have the challenges and Hashem helps us and and you know it just gives people a lot of hope that every all the struggles we went through and that we were able to uh, to uh, find such a beautiful meaningful life it gives them hope that they can do it also I remember we spoke in, in the University of Seattle and a, a 20 year old girl came up to me and said she'd been thinking that she really can't do it but after hearing us, our story, she thinks she can. Wow. We try to ask all our guests questions at the end, which we're going to ask. And I have a specific question that I'm going to ask after. But Nachi's going to start off. If you can sit down with one person who is no longer alive, could be from history, be recent, the past, and speak to them for one hour, who would it be? It's <laughs> quite a question. Question for each of you. I mean... I, I, if I'm allowed to choose two, one from the ancient past and one from modern, I mean, first of all, David HaMelech. David HaMelech, where we live in Yerushalayim, we can look out from our street and see the kever of Shmuel HaNavi. Really? Wow. It's amazing. Shmuel HaNavi is the one who anointed David Melech Yisrael, and I feel such a kinship with David HaMelech because, you know, I, I mean, he told it all. He wasn't afraid to say where he came from. He wasn't afraid to say how, how, you know, his faults. And if you can, if you can admit to your you know, inadequacies, you can do tshuva. Right. You can't do tshuva if you think you're perfect. And David HaMelech, he's the king of Israel. But, and, and that's why he's the king. Because he, it sounds like a chutzpahdik statement, but in, in my opinion, 
He's an example for every Yid of a real David HaMelech was as real as you can get. As real as you can get. He wasn't afraid to say, I'm a worm, I'm a nothing. And he wasn't afraid to say that Hashem made me into a, 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 a Melech who can overturn the whole, the whole world. And, 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 and so David HaMelech was real. And, his, and, and, and you know, his story is un un unbeatable. And that's, you know, that's what we need now, someone who's real, to lead not just Am Yisrael, but the whole world. Not a politician who's going to say how great I am, but a real person who's going to say, you know, I'm a nothing, but Hashem made me into a something. Sure. And, and, and that was David Hamel. Which modern person? Chofetz Chaim. Chofetz Chaim. <laughs> I mean, uh, also, you yeah, yeah. They say, you know, Chafetz Chaim would talk to himself, you know, Yisrael Meir, you know, you have to work on yourself, you know, you have to. And That's beautiful. He, uh, and Mrs., what about you? Who, who would your person be? This is so interesting, you know, I never thought about that uh, specific, you know, that idea. But I'm just thinking, Esther Hamalka, how did she do what she did? Because it was, she gave up her whole life for, for Am Yisrael, and I just think it'd be so inspiring just to talk to her because she was, she just gave everything. She, <laughs> I mean, just think how, how miserable it must have been to be married to Akashvero. She was, <laughs> he was horrible. <laughs> but, but she Very did it for Claudia Sroll. And she, uh, and has she just, you know, the whole time she was so sneeze and she didn't want to be queen and she, and as she ate only kosher, she just ate vegetables, and she, she had the strength to uphold the Torah in the most trying, difficult circumstance. And I just think it'd be so amazing to, to speak to her. Right. Um, That's a really beautiful answer. Then Nach's gonna ask the next question. It's a question. It's a question. <laughs> oh. um, if, do, you, do you guys have any specific mitzvah in your life right now that talks to you more than any other? I hope this is answering the question, but I'm going to try. Um, and it has to do with the, my latest book also, Hold On. I, and, and, and the theme of all my book, 2020 Vision also. And that is, uh, I don't know if Am Yisrael is taking seriously the profundity of what's going on in the world today that, you know, lately, last week, Miami, Mayron, and uh, Givat Zev, uh, we're seeing all these nebuch, the collapses, people being killed, being crushed. And, and, and I, I was writing about this the last few weeks in my column, <coughs> what's Mashiach? What's Mashiach? Mashiach really, uh, uh, this is also when I, when I look out from our street near Yerushalayim at the Kever of Shmuel and Navi, so I think, you know, what, what, is, what is the Shmuel and Navi? Do we put the oil on David and Melech? What is the oil? What is this? Mashiach is, 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 means anointing with the oil, oil, putting the Shem and Zayas. And then the, and the Gemara tells us Shem and Zayas. Why Shem and Zayas? Because for, for this oil, to be created has to be the olive has to be crushed, has to be crushed, and 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 this crushing that's happening somehow is part is part of the process by which Mashiach is coming, and I think we don't take it sufficiently seriously the changes that are going to occur in the process of Mashiach coming. That the beginning of 2020 vision, I'm not going to go into it specifically now, but there's a Malbim there my wife mentioned, on Yecheskel and Navi. And the Malbim mentions, Milchemes Gagumaga, what does it mean? It means, according to the Malbim, Yishmo and Esav fighting it out, this a cataclysmic clash of two <coughs> cultures in which are going to destroy each other. It's very possible we're going to see the destruction, mutual destruction of Esav and Yishmael. And, and, and which means the entire culture we're living in 
is shaking, is in danger, is and 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 when Mashiach comes, it's going to be a different a different world. It's not going to be the world of Adam anymore. It's not going to be the world of this super gashmius world we're living in now. It's going to be a, a world of Torah. It's going to be a beautiful, perfect world. As a session, we should see it. Um, and, 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 and if we would really contemplate the magnitude of the changes, which probably looks like, according to Chazal and Navi, will take place before Mashiach, I, I think we'd be different people. We'd be serious people, and, and, and our davening would be different, our actions would be different, and we would be afraid of sinas chinam, we'd be afraid of you know, divisions among Am Yisrael. Our whole lives would change if we really contemplated the magnitude of the change, which it looks like is gonna happen. Bez Hashem, it should be b'shalom. I mean, you know, nobody should get hurt, but who knows what's gonna be. And, 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 but it's going to be a very different world when Mashiach comes. And if we would think about that, I think that all, everything we do would change. You know, our personal interactions, as I said, our davening, our, everything we do in our life, you know? Right. You know, and, and, and I, I think, so, so that's really what I had in mind for the last book, 2020 Vision. Yeah, 2020 Vision is a super realistic novel which people love. I mean, there are so many stories. There are people who are living in Eretz Yisrael today because they read 2020 Vision. And, 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 but, but it's a novel, a realistic account mm -hmm. of how Mashiach could come. Okay, I, I guess I talked hmm. probably, no, probably too much, but whatever. Okay. Answer, what about you? Uh, okay. So, so I mean, speaking of all the books I just, by the way, is Feldheim distributes all the books and uh, they published this one, but we have different publishers for each one. It's, it's a whole story, but I won't go into that. What I want to do is answer your question now. Okay. Yeah. So I would say that for decades and decades, the mitzvah we specialized in was Hachnas Esorchim, because we always, always had guests for Shabbos, people live with us, and so on. And I would say that since COVID and certain changes in our lives in terms of whatever, I won't go into all the details, but I would say that Kirov is really the mitzvah that's, that's uh, our main um, focus now. And when I say Kirov, I don't mean just Kirov to, for people who are far away from Torah, but people also who are Torah observant, because everybody, I think, everyone needs Chizok, everyone needs inspiration. For example, the book Hold On, I, we, I got phone calls from quite a few famous Rebbitsons who say that their davening has changed because of this book. No. And and that this means so much to them. And so many people say they got chizuk. There's a there was a journalist who interviewed us. We had a, like a whole press conference when this came out. It's also out in Hebrew On called Tax Taxi Kazak. We had this press conference. So this journalist told uh, the lady who was doing some PR for us. He said that he had to have a biopsy. He was very scared. He, he that he had something really serious. He took this book with him and he held on to mm. it during the biopsy. This book gave him so much strength. So, Baruch Hashem, you know, we're able to to um, help each other in so many ways, and this is really what we're all about. That's what we're. I, I we think do. we should <laughs> mention that since Central Park to Sinai came out, and we started speaking, we've spoken. I mean, all over the world, we we've we've spoken in actually in 15 different countries, and 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 the books are out in, in many languages. So. And, and it's, un it's unbelievable because even when you're speaking, like in the former Soviet Union, and, and, and you can't sp speak their language, and you have a translator, you know, simultaneous translation, it's unbelievable because you like, you know, I would be so scared, like, this is going to really fall flat because, mm -hmm. like, how are we going to do this? And it's just exactly the same. It's unbelievable. You get the same reaction, the same hugs, the same recognition, the same. Because uh, it's we're the all language one of the Shema. That's what it we, is. we were going to do this interview in Chinese and have a translation. <laughs> yeah, right. But okay, we right. decided no, to do English. No problem. It would, it would be no problem. We do Chinese all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to finish off with this last question that you, you, you two are met, uh, married for how long? 50, 58 years. 58 Hashem. years, Klein yeah, Hara, right. and many, many more years. Oh, man. What, what advice could you give to anyone uh, listening, to Nahi, myself? What's the secret to having a uh, good, long, healthy, adorable marriage <laughs> who's gonna should i say go <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> my thoughts 
Maybe, maybe you okay. know because I just you know stumbled into this and I met, <laughs> met a very nice lady and she <laughs> is good to me. I mean, she tolerates me. I would say that I think people need to know that the more they give, the more they have. People should not expect instant gratification. You make me happy. Me, 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 me. No, if you think of the other person and you give to the other person and you're kind to the other person, the blessings come back to you a thousandfold. You just, just, you know, if, if, you're, if you're kind and you're good to a person, then you're going to see that this, this, it's a beautiful, uh, you know, it's reciprocal. And, and also, it's very important to have a sense of humor because there are always so many crazy things, difficult things, bumps <laughs> in, 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 that you go over in, in, in life and then you go through. And if you can laugh, I mean, this is really part of our essence as Jews, Yitzchak, laughter. Uh, it's a laughter that's, that uh, Sarah could give birth at the age of 90 to a baby. And, and so laughter is, is something that if you can laugh together over things, um, I think that this goes a long way to, to having good feelings and being able to get through a lot of tough things uh, in life. And, and, and you know, you, um, um, I think it's, uh, you know, some of the keys to give and to laugh. I, I, maybe I could just <laughs> add one, sure, two sure. thoughts to this. First thought is that marriage is not just an opportunity, but it's a necessity to really work on yourself and, 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 and make a din v'cheshman and, 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 and think about things like anger and selfishness. I mean, I'm an expert at dealing with this because, I mean, I, I have a lot to work on. And um, um, uh, it, 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 one really has to refine one's behavior to make marriage work. And this is a constant process which is so difficult. You know, I was just thinking about it, I'm writing about it this week, because it just hit me. Why on earth does the davening every day begin with the Akedah? What, the Akedah is such, so far beyond me, like how on earth could Avram Avinu have, have, have done this, gotten to the point where he's willing to make a Corbin of his son, you know, like I, I can't even deal with this. Like, what does it have to do with me? It's so far beyond me. That Madrega, I'm, I'm, you know, like I'm nowhere near. And then it, all of a sudden it hit me that Avram Avina was teaching his children a lesson. On whatever level you are, you have to overcome yourself and do what Hashem tells you. And it's such a struggle, and it's such a fight, and it's so difficult but don't give up. That one. Okay, point. anger. One that's points. a big one. Um, you know, as some as in our society, there are people who say, "Oh, you have to vent. You have to say the truth. You have to get it out and say, you know, what you really think." But but the Torah way is absolutely not. This is you have to think of the consequences of what you of your words, and and words spoken in anger can hurt a person even more and more long lastingly than a physical injury. It leaves scars, and that that emotional scars that maybe won't heal and <clears throat> so handling anger is a big one and and that is may i remember but young grace used to say uh, shalom that that um you should if you're angry zip your mouth closed go wash your face walk around the block whatever you have to do calm down and then when you're calm you can think it and, and think about it is it something important i really should talk about or is it some stupidity that i just got angry about for you know it's ridiculous um, but if it's important, you have to talk in a certain way to show that your husband or your wife that you love him or her and that you, you don't love what they did, but you love the person and in a calm way say, you know, I don't, you don't realize how this hurt me, this meant whatever it meant to me. But uh, that's um, one thing. And I think another very important thing is appreciation. We, it's really basic that, that we appreciate Hashem, that we give our, our gratitude, the first commandment. Hashem tells us that he took us out of the land of Egypt. I'm Hashem who took you out of Egypt. He's not saying, I am Hashem, your God who created the world. I am Hashem, your God. 
and I took you out of Egypt, and that we, this is gratitude is really the appreciation, that, uh, the first commandment. We should have gratitude to Hashem and to express gratitude to each other, to thank your husband, thank your wife for what they do for you, and, and uh, you know, thank Hashem, first of all, we're thankful to Hashem, and, and uh, I start every morning before I say chakras, I, I, I thank Hashem for every breath, I thank Him for every heartbeat, I thank, you know, it's, it's, we can't take these things for granted, and, and to thank each other and show appreciation, it it's, makes such good feelings. Okay. Just Cl- closing statement. Go for it. Closing statement. Another point about marriage. And that is, Baruch Hashem, we have a, a work together. We have a, a, a vision together, my wife and I. I mean, we work together and we work on the writings. We work on the, we speak together where it's a, wherever it's appropriate. I mean, some places it's not appropriate for both of us to speak, but some places, it, but, but wherever we go, we, you know, we do it together. So we have a mission together. I think it's very important also for husband and wife to have a mission together. Like, wh- you know, what's our, what do we want to accomplish in our life and do it together and, you know, make life a, 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 a a, a, a com- an avoda where you know we have a we have a purpose we we have we have a we have a point and it's really beautiful you know what you each in his or her own way you have to be yourself you know I'm very different from my wife as I told you my wife is normal and I'm whatever, <laughs> whatever I am and but 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 do it you know if you have something to, a vision together you're working together it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Let me just add to that for one uh, second. Uh, I'm sorry. Closing, that, closing. That <laughs> not every husband and wife is able to work together the way we are. <laughs> right. We, we, we know the writing, the speaking, and everything. True. That's very rare. But but I think it's important, the vision, common goals, common aims uh, to have uh, that you're really working for together, each in your own way, whether you know the husband goes off to work and you go off to work somewhere else and whatever. But to have this vision together, of of what uh, are you accomplishing? That's beautiful. It's very well, very very meaningful. Reb Reb Yisrael, Reb and Leah, <laughs> thanks so much for spending the time with us. Thank beautiful. you for having us. We loved it. Thank it's you. Such it's nice people. It's, <laughs> great, it's great to meet it's true. you. Very special. After special. all these emails. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that something special? So special. Something we didn't even get to bring up was the amount of philanthropic and not he knows I like to make up words but I think that's a real word that his family is a part of it is his father's his family they're part of like the biggest investment I think firm in the world ever I don't know much about finances as you can tell but there's definitely you could uh, google uh, his father and his family there's Fun amazing fact. but like I really I walked out of it and there's so many episodes that I want my wife to listen to but that one specifically I told my wife I'm like you need to listen to Roy and Leah talk about their journey it's really beautiful okay so if you're a husband and you're listening to this maybe request that your wife listen to it or vice versa um, and just a little note for all those who are watching i feel like we're doing a lot for those who are watching for those who are listening yeah no come on listeners yeah but those who are watching there's nothing in this cup okay so i just wanted to say social media is so fake i just took a drink before nothing in it and right? i'm not even here i'm a hologram exactly yako was on zoom so <laughs> i was like, gonna say i'm on mars <laughs> but you're like, zoom. Did I just, you're yeah okay? i'm okay I'm okay and if i wasn't okay <laughs> i would use amr <laughs> <laughs> good one and remember everyone's meaningful that's what's on twitter that's today. a terrible slogan i know i don't like it either okay bye <laughs>